Well, um, thank you, John, for joining us. Pleasure. And I thought if we could um, begin at the beginning and talk a little bit about um, when and where you were born and where you grew up. I know you grew up in Indonesia and also in Singapore, and we'd um, love to hear about those experiences. Sure. So I was born in, uh, in the island of Java, on the city of Bandung in Indonesia. Uh, lived in Indonesia till I was 12, lived in two different places, one in, in Java and then also on the island of Sumatra. Uh, my father was a missionary, that's how we got there originally. Uh, he shifted you know, out of the mission when I was about 12, and, but he stayed working in Southeast Asia for about 25 years, but he moved the family, we moved to Singapore. And so I was there till uh, most of my, high, till the latter part of my high school when I came back to uh, the United States to Oklahoma, which is where my, my family is from. Okay. And um, did, were you then bilingual growing up? Yeah, or? I was raised uh, speaking Indonesian outside the home and English inside the home. That was pretty much a family, a family thing. We weren't allowed, unless it was just the two, unless it was me with one of my siblings, uh, that I could speak English. But if there's any Indonesian person around, we you know, we had to speak Indonesian, and I was raised, you know, fluent hmm. Indonesian, so. Was, uh, with your father, or your parents, I guess, being missionaries, yeah. was a religion a very strong theme of your <laughs> life and activities <laughs> growing up? Well, it, 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 it was a big part of the families, you know, as far as what we did. You know, my, my father, you know, set up, you know, uh, churches and hospitals and, schools and things like that uh, but yes we it was a big part of it um in, at least as far as the the day but you know you're a kid you know you get up you know and <laughs> do your thing was yeah oh yeah uh, could you tell us um which religion you're yeah you're, baptist you're, religion baptist, yeah. yeah um um so were you, where were you going to school while you were in Indonesia? <laughs> uh, most of my younger years, uh, we were homeschooled. Mm -hmm. uh, because schools weren't really terrific in Indonesia. My mother uh, was, she, she had had some kind of educational background uh, from a teaching. Um, both, of, both my parents had met at the University of Oklahoma. And so that's kind of home base, but uh, so she took it upon herself to be our, you know, our teacher. Mm. And you know, we had our, our garage got turned into a four four desk uh, school um, and a fifth desk for her. And basically, she taught us uh, using a, a correspondence course that that provided a lot of the materials. But she organized all four kids, and pretty much until eighth grade. Uh, she was able, she was teaching, and by the time my oldest was, uh, had finished his eighth grade, then he moved to, went to a boarding school mm -hmm. uh, for high school. But the rest of us were, were homeschooled, in my case, only until the uh, part of the sixth grade. And then we moved to Singapore at that point, and I went to a really good school called Singapore American School, which is a really nice, you know, high quality private school. Um, where I then did my education for junior high through ninth grade before then moving to Norman, Oklahoma and, you know, going to a, a good public school in, in Oklahoma called Norman High School. It's quite a, quite a phase change from Singapore to Norman, Oklahoma. But had you, but since that was your family base, had you been? Yeah, we'd go Oklahoma? back periodically. Yeah. Uh, about every four years, we'd go back to visit. Uh, that was kind of the way things were done. And, and so that kept a little contact with what it's like to, you know, to live in the United States. So it, it was culture shock, but it was not as severe. And plus you're a kid, right. you know, kids are pretty resilient. And so, it, you know, it's no big deal. Was, what were your interests growing up? Were you, um, were you interested in business from an early period or were you interested in science and technology, math? I, to, to be honest, I love sports. And so <laughs> that was probably what I enjoyed the most. Um, but school came easy. You know, I liked, you know, I always liked math. 
and I always had a real strong affinity to maths and sciences were easy and kind of cool and fun. But I kind of liked everything. Mm-hmm. I just I actually enjoyed school. Um, it was never you know something that I dreaded. I always enjoyed. It. Maybe it's because you know being homeschooled. It was kind of really interesting because I always knew what my assignments were for the next day. And in Indonesia, you know, we didn't have electricity, you know, most of the time. And so we pretty much, you lived pretty much by the, by the sun, mm-hmm. right? You, know, you had candlelight at night or kerosene lamps. But, um, and so I'd get up at six o'clock in the morning, you know, I'd go down, <laughs> I'd be, I'd be, uh, you know, almost halfway through my, my school day by the time it's breakfast, <laughs> you know, and then I'd oftentimes be done with school by 1030 or 11. And then I had all day before my Indonesian friends got out, they didn't get out of school till I think like 1.30 or 2.30. And so I basically could do whatever I wanted. And I was the youngest, so I waited oftentimes for my siblings to get done with their school. And so I read and I did, you know, you made stuff, you, you know, you did things to occupy your time, you know, and I always was interested in everything. So it was actually, you know, it was really easy. When you, so when you um, came to Oklahoma for high school, um, was, did your interests change or develop during those years or? I mean, girls came, <laughs> came into the picture, you know, so you gotta, you gotta give credit where credit's due. But no, uh, I always, you know, I always enjoyed a variety of things. Uh, that's probably one of the things I, you know, really value is I've never been pretty narrow, you know, minded about things. I've always enjoyed, you know, a variety of things, look at things from different angles, you know, and I continue that in kind of my interests. How did that, how did that factor in then to trying to decide what to do for for college, or you know, it seems like if you're interested in a lot of things, it some ways makes it a harder, harder choice. You know, you're given too much credit to a 17, 18 year old, <laughs> you know, boy. Uh, you know, my both of my parents went to the University of Oklahoma. My two older brothers and older sister went to the University of Oklahoma. I don't know, six or seven aunts and uncles went to the University of Oklahoma. I don't know, 20, 25 cousins. I mean, it was, okay. it was crazy. Yeah. Like my whole family, I, I never applied to college. Um, you know, they basically, you take your test, you, you know, your test scores, they just automatically sent them to, you know, OU and OSU. That's the, the other university, which we, you know, rival, right? <laughs> and so and I got accepted to both, had scholarships to both. And it's like, well, I guess I'm going to OU. <laughs> and that's pretty much, that's pretty much it. Then there's a question of what to study. Right. I, I didn't quite know what to study. I enjoyed math. I started with, you know, I thought I'd be an engineer. You know, I took a lot of, you know, I took math, all the maths you could as a freshman and, you know, and sophomore. And I just assumed I would do something there, but I won, I ended up changing. Uh, one of my semester, I think it's second semester sophomore year, I couldn't take a course, a certain course, because it was, something happened to it, so I had a gap that I had to fill. And so, you know, it was really hard, you know, late in the process to find one to fill it. And one of the ones to fill it was an upper level econ course. Mm-hmm. And since I was pretty strong in math, you know, I had good grades and stuff like that, I had to petition. They said, sure, you can, you can handle it. <laughs> you know, so I took this course and just had an, a really great professor. You know, and he, I, I just really enjoyed the class. And, uh, and then at that point, you kind of had to decide, you know, into sophomore years when you had to make a decision on what major. And I'm like, you know, I think I'm going to try econ. So I actually switched to econ um, and I finished as an econ major. And I actually had a minor if there was such a thing. I was really into kind of philosophy and things like that, too. So I kind of had a lot of math. I did a major in econ, but I really enjoyed kind of the, you know, the, the philosophy, you know, so I took a variety of philosophy classes too. So it's kind of a pretty eclectic, um, but, you know, strong math underpinning. Well, philosophy and, and economics often, you know, kind of go together. They do. So, yeah, they do. Yeah. Maybe not the more mathematical. Well, well there's a lot both, of, a lot yeah, of math and there's a lot of math in, you know, in econ. Yeah. You know, and then econ kind of, 
got me into some business. I had to take some business courses, and that was kind of interesting. But I, you know, and it happened to be in the business school. Econ was in the business school at, at OU. And so it's like, so I got exposed to business, but, you know. So what were your, what did you do as you came to the end of your studies, your undergraduate studies? Oh, uh, well, then you're like confronted with what are you going to do, right? And I had no idea, right? I took the, the GRE, thinking I might want to get a PhD in econ. I took the GMAT, thinking I might want to go to business school. I took the LSAT, thinking maybe I'll go to law school. A couple of my uh, uncles were, were top lawyers in Oklahoma. You know, so I had no idea, right? Took them all, you know, got accepted into programs at all of them, and I'm like, oh, now I'm in real trouble. You know, what am I gonna do? But, but um, you know, I, I was gonna take uh, some time between things anyway. I pretty much had decided through the process that, that I thought, you know, business school probably was a better fit for me. I'm not a great reader and writer. You know, I mean, I'm a slow reader. Um, I, I remember things real well, but I'm a, a slow reader, and you got to do a lot of writing. And I'm like, mm, maybe that's maybe PhD and law may not be the right fit. And business seemed pretty interesting. Um, a friend of my brother's had had graduated. Um, my oldest brother had had gone to Harvard Business School, and so I at least kind of had an inkling that there was such a thing as a pretty high quality, you know, education in, in business. But I really didn't know much about it. Um, I just assumed I was going to go work. I was interested, kind of, thought computers were kind of interesting, had taken some ba very basic, no pun intended, <laughs> you know, um, courses, um, and so got exposed to it, but didn't quite know, you know, went and applied to maybe get a job at IBM, you know, do that. And so I was going through applications, and out of the blue, my sister, who had moved to the East Coast, she, you know, we, my brother got ma one of my brothers got married and we went to you know we were all at the wedding and I started chatting with my sister and it's like you know about the dilemma of what to do go take a job knowing that I was going to qu I'd quit in like two or three years to go to graduate school just didn't feel right you know someone's going to train me and I'm gonna mm -hmm. then just, just as soon as, as once I'm done being trained I'm going to leave so <clears throat> she said well why don't you come teach she was a teacher at a prep school in Massachusetts. They need a coach and they need a math teacher. And I'm like, okay, two of the things I really enjoy. They need a, you know, a basketball coach, a soccer coach, and a tennis coach. Well, I play all three of those sports. <laughs> you know, this was a really interesting opportunity. So I'm like, I'm like, yeah, what the heck, I'm, you know, I'll, so she, you know, she went, went back home you know, to where she was and talked to the headmaster. And the headmaster said, yeah, get him to come out and talk to us. So I went and visited him. He says, basically doing it on her sure. credentials. She, you know, if you're half as good as your sister, we'd love to have you. <laughs> right? And I'm like, you know, I'm like, great. So I went and did that. Uh, I, I went and taught uh, math and um, you know, as a dorm parent and did the whole thing. Had never been at a prep school, you know, so it didn't. But I, th I think the Singapore school experience had given me a little insight because that was also a boarding. They had some boarding and my older brother had gone to a boarding part there. While we were in Indonesia, he had gone to Singapore American School. Oh. And so I kind of had a little insight and my sister being there obviously, you know, gave a lot of insights. So I did that um, and then I found out uh, later that I got accepted into a, a few schools, including Harvard, for, and I'm like, well, I can't turn down that. That's a pretty cool opportunity. So I only did the teaching for one year, let them, but they knew I was going to be applying. Mm -hmm. So it was, they're pretty, you know, happy for me. So, you know, I did a year there and then went to HBS. Which, um, which high school? It's called Eagle Brook. It's uh, actually a middle middle school. It's in Deerfield I, I, Deerfield Academy, next to Deerfield, if you know. Yeah, I'm from Greenfield. Oh, so, okay. Yeah. So yeah, I so hung out in Greenfield the, back right. in the day. Yeah, yeah. Northampton. Uh -huh. You know, we did it all. Okay. So. And that probably also gave you a chance to check out, you know, to easier to go Correct. see if you really want to be in Cambridge. Correct. Or, well, it gave me uh, to the whole Northeast. I right. mean, because I, you know, I applied to all the most of the top business schools. You know, a lot of them, you know, at least four or five of them are in the 
the general area of the Northeast. Right. You know, so it was a good opportunity. You know, I was going to wait and see where I got accepted and then I, you know, go, you know, check them out. And so it made it pretty easy. And um, how did you find, so what years were you at the Harvard Business School? Uh, 79 to 81. 79 to yeah. 81. So you're there just after Dan Brecklin. <laughs> well, that. well, that's an interesting story. That, uh, that, oh. uh, that will enter into the picture. Right. When, once you're... When I'm yeah. at business school. Right. Okay. Well, um, I'd love to hear how you reacted to their, you know, the case study method and, and you know, how you took to that environment. Case study method was a really good environment for me. In fact, I, w I, wish, I wish all my schools... I I'm a very, you know, I'm a very verbal uh, learner mm -hmm. uh, and I like, you know, discussion. It, it does some. It stimulates part of my brain cells, different than just reading or being off in a corner. And so I've, I've kind of always enjoyed that type of work. I'm not really a one-on-one, -on -one, one you know, by myself working, right? You know, kind of thing. But um, so it's really, uh, I really enjoyed it. I mean, it's tough, and they sometimes a little overly macho as far as back then anyway. The they'd try to kind of grind people down a little bit more than they needed to. So, mm -hmm. but they have since you know, since improved that and gotten a little <laughs> bit more connected to the 21st century. So at least my understanding from talking to people that have graduated since then, it's, it's improved. And how did your interest develop while you were there? What, and I understand you probably have to, you know, choose an area. First year you don't in. choose anything. Oh, okay. First year you're pretty much, they assign you to, to 85 to 90 of you in a section you know, of the, and there's, I think, nine sections. So it's a big, it's a pretty big class, like 700 or so to the class. And, but you're, you're with the same group, three classes a day. Each class is an hour and a half. And everybody in the first year takes the exact same thing. Oh. That's what it was back then. There was no electives, right? That happens in your second year. Okay. And so you get the broad, you know, exposure to everything. And... I really enjoyed marketing. Marketing mm. just was very intuitive to me, you know, and, you know, it was really, I just found it really interesting. Now, I enjoyed, I enjoyed other things as well, but I really enjoyed marketing. You know, I had, had a, you know, good professor and, you know, and it really proved to be very formative to the way I thought about what I'd be interested in. And what would you just, if you had to describe what was the real, the crux or the, the, the heart or the foundations of marketing, you know, as you were coming to understand it, uh, how would you describe that to somebody who's heard of it but doesn't really? Yeah, it's, it's really, I mean, people look at it a lot of different ways. There's some formulaic parts of it. There's some intuitive parts of it. In, in, Kind of what's neat about it is it's 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 a discipline if there is such a thing that is really left and right brain there's parts of it that you got to be pretty analytical about the way you approach things there's others that you got to be pretty intuitive about the way you do things and i like that that appeals to because i'm kind of <laughs> i'm kind of that way uh, i'm left-footed and right-handed you know so i just <laughs> things aren't quite wired properly you know so it, it 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 actually bodes well but it's really how do you find a you know a customer need you know and help them figure out you know whether the the product that you have you know fits them and you, you know and so it's 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 finding that connection between a need and filling it mm -hmm. you know is kind of what i think the heart and soul of what marketing is now you can be more product marketing, you can be more marketing communication, and you can be more strategic marketing. I happen to like all three. You know, I, I probably lend more towards the strategic marketing, and that's kind of what I found kind of really interesting about it. But I love products, and I love that how you, you know, find the right, understand the people and the, the audience and the customer prospect well enough that you know that in fact what you have actually solves their problem or helps them, whether they understand the problem that they have yet or not, you have something that can improve their life. And that's kind of what's driven me and that's why it attracted me ultimately into computers and then ultimately to Silicon Valley is mm. and why I've stayed here. 
It's just that, you know, coming up with new innovative things, products, services that just improve the world is kind of what I find really cool. <laughs> Um, you're in you're in Cambridge, Boston, at a very interesting time as um, uh, microcomputing, personal computing, all around the MIT campus. Things are going on. I, um, the spreadsheet appears. Um, how how plugged into or aware of this activity were you uh, at that time? Um, I got more plugged into it because I took a information, I forget what the name of it, I think it's basically an information sciences course my second year. And um, Dan Bricklin had been an HBS student a couple years earlier. Right. He came back to the class and gave a demonstration of this new product called VisiCalc that he had, you know, his company ha had done. And I was like, wow, this is, I, you know, this I really understand. It's computers for computer's sake, you know, programming, you know, the way it was done before, that's just very tedious, you know. But all of a sudden there's a program that you can use that lets you do something. And it's like, wow, this is really cool. Um, so I, it got my mind thinking. Uh, one of the finance professors um, that was a, you know, a, a good friend of one of my classmates, because they're about the same age, uh -huh. you know, uh, he was really into it. So I spent a little time there. But it, it hadn't taken over in my brain because as I was thinking about leaving uh, business school, I had kind of entered business school with a preconceived idea that is kind of what I should do is upon graduating is I should go do international business. I'd born and raised internationally, you know, going to Asia. Asia was, you know, I thought was gonna, would be a really cool place to go. You know, it's kind of, you know, full cycle, you know, kind of, and sure. I'm like, so that's what I kind of had blinders on. I was gonna go to, you know, back to Asia. And so I only interviewed with people really, I mean, I interviewed a variety, but then I narrowed it down to ones that actually could help me get to Asia. And it turns out back then, the only thing you could, that people would do where they'd kind of really guarantee that was the big commercial banks. Uh -huh. Okay, so very cool, I thought. So I took, you know, I, upon graduating, um, I took a job with one of the large commercial banks in New York City. And this and their activity in Asia was kind of like investment banking activity? This was not or? investment banking. I did not want to be investment banker or consultant. I'd pretty much ruled that out. That just <laughs> didn't seem like a good lifestyle that I really would enjoy. Hmm. You know, I had plenty of my friends do it, but it just didn't really appeal didn't to me. Appeal. No. Okay. So, but I thought doing a general business, and I thought, you know, go do commercial banking, you'd see a bunch of businesses, and I'll figure out what I want to do. Because okay. remember, I'm, I had no, I had zero business experience, right? I mean, zero. I'd been in student government, and, and that's about the extent of my organizational, you know, skills. And I had taught one year of, you know, of right. eighth and ninth grade, you know, math, right? So, and done a little coaching. So it, it's not like I had a lot of business experience, like some of my, you know, classmates had already worked for four or five years. Right. I was, you know, pretty fresh off the boat. Um, so I thought this would be a good formative. And so I took that job um, and they, you know, put me through kind of a small training program. Mm -hmm. You know, I just finished two years of MBA and I'm back into a training program, kind of drove me nuts. But I'm like, you want us to do all this financial analysis? And I'm like, I went to our the head of the training department. I said, can I take you down to this local, there's a computer store just two blocks away. I'd like to show you this program called VisiCalc because we should all be using it. It's, we can do it better, faster than the way you're, you're wanting us to do it with HP calculators and doing all this spread analysis. I'm like, this is like so tedious and you know, you make mistakes, you got to redo everything. It's, it's like crazy. So I brought the guy down, showed him 
And he's like, wow, well, yeah, that's really cool. But that's not the way we do it at the bank. We think for you to learn, you really need to have, you know, the calculator and pencil and, you know, and just kind of go through it. We don't want you to take any shortcuts. I'm like, right. Okay, so I got out of the training program. <laughs> and now I'm in the, this is, you know, two months in that. Now I'm into my, quote, real job. And the first thing they do is they want me to do some analysis of some, you know, sophisticated project, you know. And I'm like, wow. So I went to my boss, I go, you know, there's this thing called a spreadsheet on personal computers that I could do this a lot better and a lot faster. Can I take you down to this, you know, to, there's a, there's a radio shack in this case, it was like two blocks away. Can I take you down and show you this spreadsheet? So, okay, he went down. It's like, basically I got the exact same response. Huh. We don't do it that way. Hmm. I'm like, wow, this is, this is nuts. So I went to my boss's boss. I said, you know, there's this, you know, there's a better way to do this. He goes, oh, that's not really the way we do it. Now, I've been at the bank like three months. And I went to my boss's boss's boss. Isn't that kind of a risky move for uh, you? It would probably not be the politically correct thing to do, mm -hmm. you know, for, you know, first, you know, you've been there. But I'm like, this is nuts. Right. And so he goes, what a great idea. <laughs> Get one. I'm like, okay. So I went and, went and picked who I thought would be the best dealer to buy it from. It was one of the ones that I'd gone to. I was really impressed by them. Uh, it turns out they were, this, there was a firm there that was started by three Stanford MBAs, and they were trying to kind of introduce personal computing into Wall Street and, hmm. you know, all the big New York, you know, thing, uh, New York uh, businesses, and they're really sharp. They were very helpful. I got, you know, I bought, you know, an Apple III. That was the state of the art. Oh. Advanced VisiCalc, I think, you know, state of the art. And needless to say, is a huge success. And, and then I'll, and I'm like, oh my God, I just had to go to my boss's boss's boss to get this for something that was just dead obvious and is highly productive. And if every bank in New York City is just like this, there is a huge opportunity. What am I doing working at the bank? I should be working, you know, selling computers. And because I was really interested, I'd been reading a lot about personal computers at that point. And in a kind of a little flashback as I was doing this kind of thinking, one of my marketing professor, my first marketing class that I took, he goes, if you ever want to be really good at marketing, you need to, you really ought to do two years in sales. Well, banking, that's what you do. You're basically a salesperson. You're hmm. selling the services of the bank. So, okay, that was fine. But now I had a chance to actually, this is a product you know, that actually I could see it, I understood it, I understood why it was gonna be really successful. So I essentially went to that the firm that I had bought it from. I said, you know, uh, how would you like to have a new sales guy? Uh, I think I could be really successful here. And they said, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so basically, you know, four months after joining, I left and joined uh, this company called Morris Decision Systems, uh, which was the, was the, the dealer that okay. sold, you know, they sold Apple, IBM, and Compaq, which were arguably the top three firms. And this is just as the IBM PC had just been, you know, introduced. So this is... This is 81. So, you know, it was pretty, you know, and Compaq had just, you know, it was just not, hadn't, I don't even think it had yet been introduced. It was no, pretty close. Think. It was close to being produced, you know, but it was already, you know, we were already pretty aware of it. And so... And um, you were selling the machines to get people the spreadsheet. Well, you sell, it's again... Yeah, but you, I mean, you, that was you're, why you, they would get it. People would buy it because they had the same need that I did as at the bank. They needed it for financial analysis, that you'd sell them a spreadsheet, a word processor, you know, in this case it was WordStar most of the time, um, and sometimes they would need a database and you'd sell them DBase, mm -hmm. you know, and so, you know, Ashton Tate's, you know, and so that became kind of the core productivity solution pack 
you know, and then, you know, depending on how big, you'd sell one, and then next thing you know, you'd sell 10 to their department. You know, then you'd sell to the next department another 10 or 20. And then next thing you know, you're kind of sold them a bunch. Was, w w oh, just one quick question, and then, uh, was services, were you helping them, you know, kind of getting it set yeah. up, and that I mean, that's why I was well. attracted to this particular, you know, organization. Um, they had taken a very, they, were, they had taken a very consultative sell approach, which, which resonate with me, which they could sell not only the hardware and the software, but they could also provide training, you know, and if need be, we even had a really good, <coughs> one of the founders was, was, was really a CTO caliber guy, and if need be, he could go in and do some kind of consultative, and so he was kind of my, Ace in, you know, ace in the hole whenever I really needed to win a deal compared to anybody else. None of the other resellers had a guy like him. Mm. And so we could bring him in and he could go toe to toe with any of the, the tech, you know, the IT guys inside, the, inside the, these banks, you know, or corporations. And, you know, I, we had a pretty high winning percentage you know, because you knew how to use the, the resource because we had that full suite of, of services, not just hardware, software, but also the services. Right. Um, why did you choose the Apple III over the IBM PC or the Commodore, and did you have any problems with it? How well did it work? Um, the IBM PC was relatively new. I'm not even sure if Lotus One Two Three was out yet. Mm -hmm. I don't think it was. So the state of the art really was, was you know, VisiCalc and advanced VisiCalc. It, now, fast forward a year, I pretty much sold IBM PCs and Lotus 1, 2, 3. I didn't sell a lot of Apples. Okay, it pretty much went from, you know, a lot of it was Apples, you know, Apple IIs, Apple threes, to a year later, it was all IBM and Compaq. If they needed it to be a little more portable <laughs> or luggable, <laughs> you'd sell them the Compaq. But um, how reliable was the Apple III? Oh, it was great. It was fine. It was fine. You know, it was, I never had any issue, to be honest. Was, was this a change in terms of, um, you know, bankers using computers as differentiated from sort of the clerical staff or people doing kind of like the, transaction processing? I mean, was it, was kind of like bankers doing analysis with paper and hand calculators to personal computers or? What, well, it was what, a mixture, what was it, like? it was a mixture. You saw over the two years that I did it, you, you saw a, it infiltrated a lot of places. It wasn't just in knowledge workers, it also was secretary pools, mm -hmm. you know, doing word processing. But it was oftentimes started by the, in the analyst, you know, the people that were really crunching. You know, but then it also got in the accounting, the accounting area, you know, where people were doing spreadsheets or needed to do the equivalent of spreadsheets, right? They were I had uh, just always, uh, I kind of imagined that the analysts were using either a time-shared system or Yeah, but they're terrible. Things. Yeah. They they're, were, they're but terrible. it was not a good tool. And you were reliant on, you know, sometimes the timeshare system would go down. You're, you're relying on other people. You didn't have control. Personal computing was all about, it's personal, it's there. It's, you know, you want to print it out, your printer's right there, boom. Mm -hmm. You know, you want to save it, you know, you want to put it on a floppy disk and then go somewhere else and boot it up there, you know. So yeah, and a, that's what you oftentimes were competing against. More than not, you're competing against paper and calculators, but you would also do some where you're competing against, um, you know, time, some kind of timeshare, you know, mainframe timeshare type system. Uh, on the word processing side, you saw just a, it was Wang, and within two years, it was just gone. Hmm. It was all, I mean, it was just boom. It was just, too, that was too expensive, too cumbersome, not up to, you know, not state of the art anymore. And people wanted to have something that was cheap and flexible where you could not only do word processing, but you could do all the other things. And it just, it just. So it sounds like it must have been, you know, you were right there at this inflection point. So it must have been a very 
busy time for Oh, it was great. Yeah. It, was, it was great. It was, uh, you know, New York City, single, working hard, you know, having a great time and just in a fascinating industry, mm. just as is really kicking, you know, and you could feel it, you know, and, and the, the story then takes a little bit of change in that um, one, the, the three guys that ran, you know, the, the company, um, they were kind of interested in maybe being, you know, a, a bigger entity and they had more, you know, grander thoughts than just having one, one location. And so um, Venrock, which yeah. is the Rockefeller family venture firm, they're in New York City. And so I became, they became one of my, you know, my customers. And I was kind of encouraged to take good care of them, <laughs> yeah. right? Because they might be potential investors in the future. Well, um, I got to know uh, Peter Chris was the managing director, sure. um, and he was very interested in, you know, what was happening, you know, so to, you know, on the street, right? Because I was selling things. Well, it turns out he's on the board of Apple. Uh, and so he was particularly interested in how Apple was doing. And so, and Apple had gone from really doing really well to hardly selling any. We were hmm. hardly selling any apples. We sold a few to some of the national accounts. Some of the accounting firms had, had, had really committed to Apple and they were, they were pretty standardized on Apple, hmm. which is pretty interesting. And so I had a few of the large, you know, Arthur Young, Arthur, at that point it was Arthur Young and Arthur Anderson, a lot of the consolidation is the big eight then. So they were one of my target uh, customer groups in addition to the commercial banks. And so um, they still were, were with Apple. And so that led me to have some interesting conversations with him, which I do periodically. Uh, if when I was just checking in, then you'd want to know kind of what's going on. And so I developed a, 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 a relationship, you know, a good relationship. Um, and so you you fast forward a little later i because of my experience with the uh, with the accounting firms i got to know some of the apple people and when the lisa came out mm -hmm. we were you know they wanted us to carry the lisa and so uh, had a, our firm got to send one person to the lisa kind of training and so they selected me to do it uh, because of my, I had some of these national account, Apple national accounts. And so I went and I was like blown away by the Lisa. I'm like, wow, I now really get it. You know, I thought spreadsheets were cool, but now you got a graphical user interface that I go, you know, I think my mom could even figure out how to, this, this is just easy to, to do. And this is really, really fascinating. And so I kind of really got into that. I became the, the key demoer for Lisa. And so I'd demo it to, you know, any time we had a client, I was the guy that they'd pull to go demo, you know. And so while well, we sold a bunch of them, they're really to early adopters, right? Uh -huh. You know, you later figured out, you know, it's not quite ready for prime time, the Lisa, but it was still just fascinating. And so right about that time, I had a, a really key conversation with Peter Chris, you know, and we were talking and, you know, he goes, you know, you know, I really think, John, you ought to, you really ought to go work at Apple. They could use somebody like you, hmm. you know, because you really know what's going on at the, you know, at the, you know, the coal face, you know, yeah. the, on, on the street. You, so you have a really good competitive insight. You know, they're having a real, you know, Apple's having a real challenge getting into, you know, into business again, you know, and you know, because we're, we're losing to IBM, and I think you could be really, really helpful to them. And I'm like, well, well, the Lisa, I think is really, really cool. Now, I didn't know about the Mac. And so one thing led to another, he introduced me to Apple. And he, he set it up for me to come out and interview. Hmm. Um, you know, and I interviewed the whole, you know, I came out, met John Scully, who had just joined uh, a CEO three months earlier, Bill Campbell, who was also just gotten there, you know, and then a, the whole, basically most of corporate, you know, marketing and, you know, kind of their uh, sales, you know, inside sales, because I was interested in kind of sales and marketing. Right. So I interviewed there 
thought it was really cool. Think, thinking that I might, you know, join Apple and do Apple International. You know, oh, I'm gonna. Sure. It's a, my opportunity to, mm -hmm. you know, now to continue the journey of what I, you know, doing international. But so I did a whole day interview there. Really liked it, and. Uh, at the end of the day, they said, you know what, we'd like you to stay one more day, and we'd like you to meet uh, Steve Jobs and the Macintosh team. I'm like, what's that? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, tell me more. <laughs> right. Uh, you know, so I dug around, got a little info, and they said, yeah, they're coming out with, it's kind of like the Lisa, but a little smaller. You know, it's top secret. You can't, you might not even be able to see it, you know, that sort of stuff. But I'd like you to meet them. I think you'd really like that team. So I showed up the next day, you know, 8.30 in Steve's office, just waiting. <laughs> Wait a little longer. Then eventually he comes in, you know, with kind of looked a bit disheveled and with his cup of coffee, black coffee and a styrofoam cup and kind of, I guess my resume or something <clears throat> must have been on his desk. He looks like that and he goes, what's so effing great about you that I got to get, I got to be in here at 8.30 to meet you. <laughs> I mean, he's like, you know, if you've ever, I don't know if you've met Steve, no. but he's got, he had these deep black piercing eyes just look right through you. And, and I don't know quite what I, um, what I said, I actually have no recollection of what I said because <laughs> he's kind of that yeah. kind of personality. But whatever I said, you know, because I just said something, uh, it seemed to be fine because we continued then to, you know, have a, an hour conversation. You know, he was fascinated. He wanted to know everything about the retail experience, how, you know, how it was, why we were losing, why Apple's, you know, blah, 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 blah. And it was like, you know, he was like, whoop, whoop, whoop. It was, it was great. I, I was kind of like, at the end of it, like my brain hurts, right? But it's great. Then I continued, met, you know, the rest of the Mac, you know, kind of marketing team and some of the product people. And I was just like, wow. Did they show you the computer? No. <laughs> no. But they, you know, I, I had enough of a view of what I thought it was and the way it was described. Um, now this is, you know, this is eight months before it's launched. Right, so, so it, might, it might not have even w been working. So middle of 83. Okay. Right, so, okay. Um, so summer of 83. So it's, you know, it may not have actually been anything they could have <laughs> yeah, demoed. That's right. <laughs> or on that given day, it may not have been able to do it. So, uh, but regardless, I flew back to New York City, got a phone call from Bill Campbell about two days later saying, you know, we'd like you to join, you know, and Bill, if you've ever met him, He's a fairly persuasive, you know, he really, he thought he was a coach again, mm -hmm. recruiting somebody to join his football team. It was really great. Was, so did that hook you in particular, no, having I was already been sold. a coach? I, or, yeah, I was already sold. I, I thought he was, you know, seemed like a great guy. They, they the head of marketing at, in the Mac division, a guy named Mike Murray. Mm -hmm. Just, I mean, these are just super bright people. I mean, it was pretty, everybody I met at Apple was super bright really energetic and seemed like good people as well. And so it was a really easy decision. And I'm like, you know, a little haggle back and forth, but it wasn't much. <laughs> they could have offered me anything and yeah. I would have taken it. And, um, you know, three weeks later, I'm in Cupertino. Did you have any exposure to what was happening on kind of the, the Apple II side of the business, if you will? Uh, just from my, at the, at the Morris Decision Systems, mm -hmm. you know, I, I sold a few of them, so I understood. It was mainly going into education at that point, you know, it, it, it and we didn't do consumer, right? This, this is pretty a business-focused mm -hmm. organization, but I did some, I did work with some consultants, including one of the consultants was Missy Crisp, which is Peter Crisp's wife. She was an education consultant for some of the uh, some of the schools in the New York City area. So I okay. did help her. You know, again, part of my, you know, taking care of the yeah, that <laughs> taking, of care of the, taking care of and th these two people are the nicest. They're just fantastic people. So I would have done it. I don't care whether there's any connection at all. It turned out they're just complete. Uh, they're just fantastic people. When you when you came to, you know, came out for the interviews, did 
was the focus all on the kind of uh, graphical user interface side of Apple, or you know what was happening with the Apple III? Was that at all part of your tour or exposure? Oh, you, when I was doing the first day, was, yeah. you know, I was talking to, but it's more general. Mm -hmm. You know, it's more whether I wanted to come out and join the, you know, the marketing team. Okay. You know, so it wasn't getting into. We, I wasn't coming out to be an engineer, right? Mm -hmm. I'm not a, I'm not an engineer. I wasn't come out to program. I was going to come out and be part of the sales and marketing organization. Okay. D was there any negotiation about which? I would imagine they would want you to do the financial, business side of things. Or was did you know when you? No. Yeah, accepted? I knew when I accepted. I accepted to come out to be the head of. Uh, I was going to be the retail marketing manager for the Mac rollout. Okay. They wanted somebody that knew the dealer channel that could be in the product group to help make sure that everything we were doing, programs, the way we communicated, pricing, everything like that, fit and would be what would make us be successful in the dealer channel. Because the dealer channel is, was pretty much the way Apple sold. We're mm -hmm. extremely reliant on that. And so um, I then put together, you know, that whole, the program for that, working, of course, with our, you know, our inside sales, you know, team, and then later with the field sales organization. When you arrived, what was the landscape like for um, applications that you were going to have to, to go with it, you know, like, what, I don't know what application. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That I was. mean, we had Mac paint and Mac, right. Right. Oh, uh, that's pretty much it. Right. And we were, we had been, you know, evangelizing, mm -hmm. you know, I'm, I don't know if you've, you know, chatted with guy or, but Mike Boych was the evangelist before that, before guy. Guy worked for for Mike, uh, and you know they were out trying to convince you know Mitch Kapoor, Bill Gates, and Fred Gibbons, uh, software publishing. Those were kind right. of the three big software companies. You know, so we were actively trying to get those guys to support the Mac. In fact, we got all three of them to say they would. You know. That'd be a good video. You guys ought to, if you haven't seen it, just personally get you know, some of the, the early videos of when, you know, we, the Mac team, you know, introduced the Macintosh to the, the Apple sales organization. We did it in Hawaii. Hmm. And they had the dating game. It's really famous. They had the dating game, which had Steve, you know, Steve was the, you know, the bachelorette. <laughs> or bachelor, and, the, and the three eligible bachelors were, were, you know, those three guys, Bill Gates and Mitch Kapoor and, and Fred Gibbons. Oh, and wow. so they had a, it was really funny. And they were all trying to get them to who was going to date the, you know, who was going to date the Macintosh. And so it's it, it really, f you know, very funny. But, you know, the, the, the sales guys, you know, were just eating it up because, you know, if you're going to launch something new, you had to have this great software. Well, and it turns out that, you know. Lotus took a, didn't really ever get there. Well, that's what you I know. was wondering. Microsoft took quite a while to get there. Uh, ended up with a, a spreadsheet called Multiplan. Got out, but it was a while before we eventually got to Excel. Right. And that was like two years later. And software publishing just did a port, and it was never any good. Was that the PFS line? PFS, yeah, yeah. PFS file. Okay, so they did, they, that they, was your they, database? That was their database. And we never got DBase, we never got Ashton Tate, you know, to, to do it. And so it pretty much is pretty, <laughs> it was pretty lean. And so, uh, you know, uh, when Guy took over, he had, his, he had his hands full. But we eventually got, you know, some, some software, but it really, it took later, you know, it took almost two years before we started seeing anything of, you know, of any real, you know, oomph. Was that a, a the, the Lotus kind of um, 
the failure of the Lotus uh, software to materialize for the Macintosh, was that a, a strategic decision on their part, or what was behind that from your perspective? I think it's just really hard to do. Yeah. When you've been doing you know, the kind of programming, and you got to now go to more object-oriented programming where you got, you know, a different interface. It's just hard. Mm -hmm. You know, and these guys were flat out, you know, they're pretty successful on the IBM PC. Right. You know, that was kind of gobbling up the world, you know, and all the clones that were with it. And it, it's, it's like, this is this, you know, zero installed base. You know, how excited are you as a software guy to go, you know, support a zero installed base system when you got this millions of install base IBM PC and clones. And so it's kind of easy to, it took quite a bit to get them to move over. Hmm. And, and Microsoft did because Microsoft at that point was already thinking, you know, they kind of like the discussion we had, you know, about being more than just a, you know, being more than just a one product company, you know, doing OSs, which were obviously their cash cow, but they also saw that they needed to be in the application business, you know, so, and then they all also knew that they were going to be doing a Windows thing, so learning on the Mac was a great way to, to get a head start, which they were pretty smart about. I think some of the other ones didn't quite have the same strategic hmm. understanding or took the long view that, that Bill Gates you know, and the, and the Microsoft guys did. And right. I think it ended up, you know, probably hurting some of these companies. Hmm. Uh, Lotus did do a, a product called Jazz, mm -hmm. which was a multi, I mean, basically was a suite of, you know, products in it. And it was, it never got, it never was the, the killer app that it could have been. It just never was quite that good. And then when Excel came out, Excel was really, Excel was really good. <laughs> Um, I was interested in kind of the, that there is this difference between the Lisa and the Mac in terms of, as I understand it, sort of a closed world of, of programs in the Lisa. In essence, my impression is it was sort of like, well, it comes with what you would ever want or what you should ever want, more or less. But, but with the Macintosh, it was a much more kind of uh, open system with the idea, you know, it's a it was more akin to what had happened on the Apple II, uh -huh. right? Which, you know, I think Apple had basic, you know, that was, a, I think, the only real product that Apple did that was, I'm not positive on that, um, but it was really let a thousand flowers bloom, and that was the approach. Um, interesting story on the Lisa, so I show up, you know, fresh fresh from, you know, from New York City, you know, selling Lisa's and selling IBM's and, you know, compacts and things. And I show up at Apple to join the Mac team, you know, and, I'm, and then of course I see the Mac and wow, I'm really, you know, just, this is awesome. You know, it's really cool. And I'm like, so does the Lisa, is the Lisa gonna run, I assume it's gonna run Mac software? And the answer was no. There was no anything. It was like we were going to introduce another system. They were not compatible with each other. See, the Apple II, at least the Apple III had an Apple II emulation, and so it ran all, pretty much ran all the Apple II software. So at least it was, you know, upwardly compatible with the whole, you know, base. Mm -hmm. um, and while most people would buy it for the new stuff, not for the old stuff, at least it you know, from a marketing standpoint, it's like, yeah, your investment is still good as you upgrade. Um, but, you know, the Lisa and the Mac, they just, they didn't even work together. And I'm like, again, been there a week. I typed the, we, we had a, an email system at Apple. So I type an email to Scully and Campbell and Jobs and my boss, Mike Murray, and I said, like, Sorry, I know I've only been here a week, <laughs> but we're going to get slaughtered if we introduce the Mac and we don't have with it being incompatible with the Lisa. People are just going to laugh at us. Uh, the dealers are going to be completely confused 
and they're not going to know what to do, which one to support. This is nuts, basically. And I'm like, once again, showing my lack of, <laughs> my lack of political astuteness. But fortunately, apples are very flat, and you know, and it was, it, boom, things happened. Next thing you know, they went on a crash course to try to get there's the, the Lisa, <clears throat> the Lisa was still trying to stay alive, right? They hadn't made the tough decision to kill it yet. Yeah, and so they put a crash course to to create an uh, an emulation system on the Lisa that would run the Mac software. Hmm. It never really, really worked, and they ultimately the pr going through that exercise ultimately led to, you know, that in financial and all sorts of other things led to them, you know killing the Lisa because they just couldn't, it was too small of a company to have <clears throat> two major investments and Steve was, was persuasive enough to say, no, I think this is the way. And the rest of the organization begrudgingly uh, went along with it. Hmm. And you know, the Lisa ultimately you know, ended up being shut down pretty soon thereafter. But, Please. Uh, but the, uh, the Lisa was still I guess it was still marketed as the Macintosh XL for like a year after. They they tried to reposition it kind of as the Mac XL because it did <coughs> have the emulation system, but it just it never. It was really expensive and it was still not. It, it was a little kludgy still. Hmm. It didn't work as well as it could have. So so you don't believe that given. It, equivalent marketing push, the Lisa still would not have done as well as the Mac. It's more than marketing. Uh, one thing I did learn and really it's been a formative in my way of thinking was something I learned from Steve and the, you know, and Mike Murray and the, the Macintosh experience was great marketing starts with a great product. <laughs> and I think that's even more so now uh, it's, 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 you know, what they had at their core in their thinking, uh, I think it's really survived the test of time and I think it's even more appropriate today. But yes, uh, I think it would have been challenged. I think you can't, uh, it just wasn't a good enough product technically to, and at a price point and everything like that. It, it might have evolved to, if it could have evolved to be more like a Sun workstation and gone after the high end, and if they had thought that way about it, um, maybe. But it would have been a major, major investment, and I don't think the, the, the resources of Apple at that point could have handled two major investment you know, resources to do that. Because it's different channel, a lot of stuff that's different. Listening to you talk about that, writing that <laughs> email memo, it reminded me of this Osborne effect, you know, where you're almost, you know, you're, you're creating this confusion in the market by saying, well, we just introduced this one thing, now we're introducing something else that's kind of like substantially different, you know, and so it just creates a confusion uh, on all levels about you know which correct which which direction are we tacking in it, it, it i believe that it was going to be too difficult to navigate with our with our dealers and with key customers hmm. the apple II was market wise difference we had you know from apple it you know apple II was really kind of the consumer but more in education k to 12 and they took the Mac, went into the universities through a really cool program that Steve and Daniel Lewin kind of headed up called the Apple University Consortium. And so that was really forward thinking and that it was really Mac's job to be in kind of small business and business. Kind mm -hmm. of our, our model was we were going after knowledge workers, you know, wheels for the mind. That was kind of Steve's, you know, and Mike Murray's kind of mantra, a general productivity tool you know, a bicycle that you could do all sorts of things with. How did, um, how did the, your kind of retail channel, you know, react to the Mac and to the, 
the general kind of um, marketing push around it? Well, I think, I think the Mac launch was extremely successful. I mean, I think, you know, the 1984 ad was quite impactful. The, the way as we rolled it out to the sales force, our sales force was really, really, I mean, they were, you know, everybody was like, you know, it was a pep rally. I mean, they were really fired up coming out. So everybody was pretty enthralled. And you got early adopters that will buy anything, mm -hmm. right? You know, the, what we now call fanboy. I mean, you had that. And so for the first, you know, the first little bit, people were just buying it because it's cool. But then to, to go beyond the early adopters, and you're now starting to get into people that have to kind of justify while they're doing it, all of a sudden it needed to be able to do things. And that's where, you know, it all started out pretty good, <laughs> but you know, we didn't have software. And so until we were gonna have enough software, we were gonna struggle. And you know, by, by the end of 84, you know, going into 85, you know, the Mac was struggling. It was not just, you know, it was, wasn't hitting its sales targets. It was, you know, it was struggling. I want to take a step back, but um, what did, what was your role in the launch itself? Uh, I was the retail marketing manager, which means my job um, was to kind of help make sure that the programs, pricing, and the way we communicated, uh, and training for our dealers was appropriate, so that so that they could absorb and you know be successful with it at the retail, you know, at the dealer level. So that was my part of it. There's others that did the Marcom, you know, the ads. I didn't have anything to do with the 1984 ad other than saw it and went, went <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, it, it, that was pretty wild, you know, or you know. So my main thing was really focused there. Was the 128K memory um, of the original Macintosh, was that a problem with, with, uh, with the users? Uh, not the early ones, because it did things that no one else had ever done. You know, a little thing you can put in this case and it says hello to you. I mean, it's like, <laughs> this is like really, really, really cool. It's the promise of what it could be. Right, and people believed that there would be a spreadsheet. People believed there'd be, you know, a better word processor than MacWrite, but MacWrite was okay. People mm -hmm. believed there'd be database. People believed it would have all the software that the IBM PC just easier to use. And that was, it was sold with that belief. And some people are willing to believe it will come. <laughs> Others need it to be there when they buy it. Mm -hmm. And that's the difference between kind of early adopters and guys that aren't early adopters. As, as, the, as the difficulties were kind of setting in 80, late 84, 84, or into 85, I guess it yeah, would be. Yeah, late 84, and then, but now that's leading yeah. into, now we got the laser rider. Right. Right, which, you know, that's coming. Well, r right before we get to that, one thing, uh, did, was there ever a discussion uh, internally about, you know, in the kind of Macintosh side of things, that maybe we ought to just do our own crash program and like make our own spreadsheet or as we had with, you know, Mac right, Mac spreadsheet. I, just wondering, or would I'm sure there were conversations, you know, because frustration, yeah. you know, because people just aren't doing what we thought. But we also had, but we saw, you know, we saw glimmers of hope, <laughs> right? Because they just weren't doing it as fast as you wanted, or as or as good as you wanted them to do, right? And that was the frustration. But but you know, there's they're out. We're out talking to a lot of different software guys. I mean, you'd probably get a, a little bit deeper if you talked to Boich and, you know, Guy, you know, because they were, you know, they were really, you know, that was their job right. to do. Well, maybe we should then switch to how the, the laser writer idea, you know, or what was happening with Apple with 
printers when the, the laser printer idea occurs, or if you could just bring us into that. Um, I mean, the laser, by, the, by 84 is pretty much, there was gonna be a, a laser printer. There's gonna be something that was gonna be able to take this graphics, you know, on the screen and put it out there prettier than the image writer, you know, little dot matrix printer. Right, and so no one really knew what that was other than the guys that were, you know, on the products that were a little closer to it, but you knew it was coming, you know. We didn't know, I think early on, we didn't know what price it was gonna be, you know, so it's all, wow, this is gonna be really cool. But, you know, as it got closer and closer to, you know, the fall, you know, and we were gonna be launching, you know, the, the printer in early 85, you know, then, you know, you're starting to, they're starting to get the whole, the whole marketing push was to do something called the Mac Office. Now mm -hmm. we're also hoping that there's gonna be software to go along with it, right? And we still didn't quite have the full suite of all the software that we m might have wanted. But you, I, I, my memory may be a little foggy as well. I don't think we could demo Excel yet. I don't think that was quite ready, but MultiPlan was. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if Microsoft Word was quite ready yet. I don't think it was, but they were in development. And so, you know, I, th I think the view was that there was enough and that with this printer, you know, and we had Apple Talk, which was the, you, you had a network to share the printer, which was pretty advanced. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's built in, no extra, you didn't have extra cards, extra cost. You just need to plug this in and next thing you know, you're, you're on a network. It's like, wow, that's kind of cool. So there's a lot of foundational stuff that was really cool. And so that became kind of the marketing push. You could, uh, probably should talk to like uh, Barbara Culkin. She was the product, you know, she was responsible for the- The Macintosh The office. Mac office, she Mac was the office. product marketing, you know, head for that, working for Mike Murray. And so she was, you know, I, I at that point did a, was, um, did a special project. To, as that was being launched, I took on another role um, at Apple, which was to look at um, uh, to, to look at the education market. So, uh, part of leading up to the Mac Office, I was the Marcom manager. Uh huh. So after the retail rollout, so the first year I did preparing for the retail rollout and the retail rollout. I wanted to be a mark. I at that point pretty much convinced myself and my boss that I wanted to be become a really good marketing guy, and I wanted to someday be VP of marketing. And so he said, "Okay, you're going to go be the Marcom manager." So so and and this it would be for the national kind of advertising campaign. This would be for everything. Like for everything. I, I would be the person in the Mac division that was responsible for Marcom, which means. Advertising, PR, events, promotions. Now, th the decision maker was always Steve. Mm -hmm. You know, for anything important, you know, anything that was in, Mike Murray was always also part of that decision team, but ultimately everyone knew who the real decision maker was. If it's, if it's a critical thing or if it's something Steve wanted, he was the decision maker. Mike. You know, his job was to, you know, be his, you know, advisor to make sure and, and the recommender to say, and, and if Steve didn't really care, then Mike made all the decisions. Got it. Right. And then I was the, you know, I, my job was then to work with the ad agency, the PR agency, our creative services. And so I did that through uh, a program called Test Drive a Macintosh, where we gave Macintoshes to, um, to dealers, a loaner. We had a few of them for every deal and they could lend it out oh. to test drive because our view is if people tried it, they would never want to return it, <laughs> okay? And it was actually fairly successful. It's it expensive, but fairly successful. And it kind of motivated because we thought we needed to kind of kick it up a little. Um, so I did that. Um, we also had a program that we uh, gave Macintoshes to 100 celebrities. You know, we had done a, a, a program, the Apple II had done a program called Kids Can't Wait that they, I think that's what it's called, but it's basically they gave one uh, to every um, school in America. 
and that's how what seeded the Apple II everywhere. Well, Steve and Mike had the idea of, of let's get celebrities. You know, so I had a guy that worked for me uh, named Alfred Mandel, uh, and he became the marketing ninja. His job was to work with Steve on any special project, and one of them was this. And so we'd give, we'd give, and you know, and he'd hand deliver, you know, to you know Michael Jackson. I mean, it was great, you know. And so, and I'd tag along occasionally if it was a really interesting person. Yeah, you know, I'd go. You know. Did anybody in particular amongst those celebrities really get into it? Yeah, I think we had quite a few. I mean, I'll. Is there my, one that pops out? Uh, I think we got one to Alvin Toffler. <laughs> and I was fascinated by that, so I joined that particular, you know, and, you know, then we got him to be a speaker at one of our Apple World, you know, uh, events, which is kind of like Oracle World. I mm -hmm. mean, bring in all of our customers and salespeople, and we got him to be a keynote, and I, I really enjoyed, you know, meeting him and, yeah. you know, and talking to him about that, and that was great, so. Um, but yeah, I'd have to go through the list. I'd have to, yeah. I'd have to go s spark my memory. I do know going to the, you know, the Michael Jackson, you know, <laughs> Alfred and I went down to the Michael <laughs> Jackson concert in LA, you know, so that we could hand it to him. You know, that was pretty fun. Yeah, I can imagine. Was um, Andy Warhol and, and Sean yeah. Lennon, would yeah. they be part of that? They would be part of that. Good, good memory. <laughs> I read it somewhere. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, you know, is, is this an appropriate time to maybe um, revisit some of uh, what we talked about last yesterday in terms of how? Um, or do we want to ask more about education? For sure. Yeah, the special education project that you were doing. Yeah, that was. Uh, I, I really enjoyed it. Um, I think partially because I had taught, partially because my mom had been a teacher, partially because I just think education is really critical. And I saw from talking to my friends in the Apple II side that they were actually starting to be pretty nervous about what was happening in the K-12. You know, that the IBM PC was kind of creeping in and was now the administrators are now starting to, you know, uh, use IBM PCs instead of Apple IIs, because the Apple III really had, at that point, kind of gone away. And so it was really the Apple II competing against the IBM PC, and that's just not a fair fight. Um, and, you know, so I talked to enough of kind of what I thought were pretty, you know, forward-thinking members of our, our field organization and our corporate you know, sales and marketing organization. But the Apple II kind of, it was their, their turf, you know, and we, they really didn't want the Mac in, interfering on their turf. And so it was very political. I didn't realize quite ha as much when I started it, but I basically came to the view very quickly that, you know, strategically, Apple needed to cannibalize itself or else they were gonna be cannibalized. And so I, you know, led a kind of a, a group, you know, task force um, to, you know, kind of validate some of those assumptions and um, talk to a few of the software vendors that were supporting the Apple II to get their view of what they were doing. And sure enough, they were starting to, you know, either starting to do work on the IBM PC or really thinking about it mm. because they're getting pressure and I'm like, well, what about the Mac? What happens, what, what could we do to convince you to do that? And so, and that freaked out the Apple II group because I'm now intruding on their, you know, their mm -hmm. really strategic partners, which are the software developers. And so I tried to always include, you know, uh, members of, you know, of the, the kind of corporate you know, marketing group looking at education and key salespeople in the field. Um, we even then went in to a few of the key school districts to just kind of bounce the idea off and it's pretty clear that we had to do it, in my opinion. Hmm. And so I put together a presentation to Steve and the Mac team, they said, you're, it absolutely makes sense that you have to do it. Because my view was IBM was gonna come in and put a, 
they were going to come into the administrator, then they were going to go into the kind of the, the business classes in high school, and then eventually they're just going to create that wedge and then go down and we're, you know, Apple II is going to be toast. And so we had to cannibalize ourselves. Uh, that, then that presentation went up to exec staff and it caused a, I don't know what's the appropriate term to use, but it's, it caused a real shitstorm. I mean, it, it was, and it was right at that same time that I was doing that, the Mac was, the Mac office had been launched and had flopped. And so you had, it, you know, sales of the laser rider, as I said, had gone from 2,000 a month, 1,600, 1,200, 800, four, I mean, it was just like that. You know, it wasn't selling through the channel, you know, the dealers didn't know how to sell it. No one really wanted to buy it. It was pretty much, and it, meanwhile, that's going on. I'm creating this oh, other geez. thing with the Apple II group. And it's like, there was just a lot swirling. You know, and that was in that mix of all those kind of things is when Steve, the Steve, John Scully, and the board kind of happened. That explodes in the middle of this all. It was all exploding. In this turmoil. It was all in that, so nothing ever got decided on the, my project because just as we were trying to decide, are we going to do something or not, oh. the MAC division got blown up. Wow. Right, so, was, so there's just a lot of stuff happening and it just happened to all be happening at the same time. So you were in essence trying to rip the band-aid off of things and just say like if, if IBM is, if the PC is going to displace, you had a choice. Is it going to be the P, IBM PC or is it going to be the Macintosh that's going to displace the so Apple II? If, if you're essence? Apple, what would you rather? Right. Yeah, my view is take the step back Take the corporate, take the company view, not the division view. If you're going to be cannibalized, be cannibalized by yourself. Cannibalize, yes, the Apple II and the Macintosh, there was some, because Steve was not the most understanding or compassionate about the Apple II. He basically viewed that that was just like yesterday and all he cared about, he didn't want anything that would, that would, take any energy away from his baby, mm -hmm. right? Which he just evangelically was gonna, through force of will, was gonna make successful. And so he just didn't really, he kind of poo-pooed everything else. You so, know, and he, he, you know, and so in that political turmoil, which was very, very apparent uh, to anybody at the company, um, you know, the board was, you know, the board and Scully and everyone, there were some really tough decisions to be made. But in that, so in that leadership change, there would be little hope of resolving this K-12 conundrum. Yeah, it, it took, I think it took 18, 24 months before it got kind of resolved. And it almost, I think, actually probably took it probably took desktop publishing and the success of the Mac to know that the Mac was actually going to survive mm -hmm. to then give people enough. You'd have to ask the education guys, you know, um, you know, kind of where, but ultimately the Mac then kind of started to get inroads there. But I think we lost personally, I think we lost like two or three years. You know, and it probably really still hurt. Mm -hmm. We never quite recovered it. Right. I, I remember Apple II's still being in elementary, my elementary school, oh. till like probably 90 years. 90? Like yeah. yeah. Well, they buy things for seven years, <laughs> right? Despite the fact that the most computers are good for four or five. <laughs> you know, they, they buy them for a long time, you know, and they're very, you know, pedagogically, you know, if they've adopted a certain book and a certain, you know, software, they're going to use that. And so switching to a new platform is really expensive. Most schools don't have the money to do mm -hmm. it. So it's a big decision to, to make a switch. And so it's not an easy one. So we, you know, my, my view is you start off by putting in a Mac lab right in high school. Mm 
Mm. And you, that's your Trojan horse. Get that in there. Because that's what I thought the IBM would do. In mm. fact, that's what they did do. But, you know, you, had, you just had to think about their needs, their budget, the way they approached it. And you, gotta, you had to also think from the software developers what they had to do to make them justify doing this. Mm -hmm. So you had to give them enough reason to, you know, because they also were very conservative and took a really long view as well. It's the nature of the, you know, the education business. It's hard to get in. Once you get in, you're kind of locked in for a while. Mm -hmm. But it's it's very conservative. The the um, lack of success of the Mac Office strategy. We talked about monthly sales of the Laser Writer, you know, not going in the right direction. Uh, was that the primary metric that you could use to judge, you know, how the Mac Office strategy was doing it, since it's centered, in essence, on the laser writer that's what it was it was pitched as a you know you get buy a few Macs and a, this awesome laser printer that can print out you know everything in very professional quality you know and it's a shared device it's expensive yeah but it's a shared device so cost per is not a whole lot if you have five or six you know three four five you know that that caught that seven thousand goes to you know a thousand per mm -hmm. you know which is not a whole lot more expensive than a dot matrix printer were 700 bucks right you know so it wasn't and it's a lot better right even for just word processing and plus of course you could do text and graphics right so the, the notion of desktop publishing that was nowhere in anybody's consciousness as we launched the you know, launch the Mac. Now we had some examples, you know, Mac Publisher. There were some examples of some potentially interesting, but it was just one of the things you could do. You could do spreadsheets, you could do word processing, you could do some graphics, you could maybe do a newsletter. And that was kind of the way, it was just part of a, it's the Mac office, mm -hmm. right? So uh, how is it that, um Remind us again, how exactly did that shift of your focus, because you're on something important, which is K to 12. You know, there's this other important need over here of Mac Office not doing what it's supposed to. Did you, did you want to get from one to the it, other? Or it got blown the, up. Yeah. The division got blown up. Uh, the person who ultimately became my boss that was heading up the, the Mac they, they basically blew up the Mac division, the Apple II division, the, I think it was AT, the APG, the peripherals division, and they just had a product group. Okay. Right, so now they had a product group, and anybody in marketing, because before each division had their own marketing, so they got rid, so they put all the product people in a product group, and all the marketing people went into a corporate marketing, which they divided by uh, consumer, education, and business. Mm -hmm. And so, Mac Office, business. Goodness. So they put the, the and then it was a reorg. Um, a, a few people in the Mac group left. They did not want to be part of this. If Steve was leaving, they were leaving. You know, and so, um, actually quite a few um, just did not want to, they chose to not be part of you know, the, this new thing. Mm -hmm. Some were not asked to, some were chose not to. Uh, I was, you know, I um, got tapped on the shoulder and said, okay, uh, reorged, good news is we want you to stay, <laughs> you know, and here's the role that we would like you to take. And so, you know, it's like I took it, <laughs> okay. you know, because I thought it was, interesting and it's another challenge you know but my whole yeah the whole education thing <laughs> it became a you know it became now the the, the role of the education marketing mm -hmm. guys and i they wanted me to stay in the the business because of my you know retail background da, 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 that da, makes da. sense yeah and so but it's a kind of out of the frying pan and into the fire in in essence mm -hmm. right i mean well it was all pretty it was a pretty crazy time. Let's yeah. just say it was all kind of a blur. It yeah. was all really chaotic. For and as, as you described um, yesterday, you know, you when you came into this new challenge, um, you, you're already severely time constrained. Could you 
Well, the time constraint became obvious to me, uh, not initially. Okay. Right. First, I had to just figure out, okay, what's the lay of the land? Yeah. Right. And the lay of the land was, okay, Apple's in trouble. Sales are, you know, we're really in trouble or else they wouldn't have made this big change. Mm -hmm. You know, um, the way it was going, they probably would have come to the conclusion of killing the laser rider. You know, so it's, it's kind of interesting. We didn't talk about, you know, yesterday, but if we'd killed that, there might not be an Adobe. There yeah. probably wouldn't have been an Aldous, right? So everyone had an enlightened interest and whether the Mac would have survived, who knows? Whether Apple would have survived, who knows? Might have. I mean, they still had, you know, we had a pretty good brand name, had some really smart people, you know, who knows? Might have, probably would have, but the Mac would have been taken a, a, a quite a while probably to, to eventually get there. And who knows whether other software guys would have abandoned it, you just don't know. But my sense is the company's in crisis, the Mac was in trouble, the laser writer's in trouble, you know, that's the context. And so it, it was a crisis. And so crisis is, it, it was really interesting. It was, I, I thought it was fascinating. Personally, I mean, I was working all the time, but I thought it was fascinating. And, you know, just you had to go make some quick talk to people and get as smart as you can, assess the situation, and make a judgment call. Mm. And my judgment call was that we had to do something now. We didn't have the luxury of, of analyzing it and coming up with a... a the perfect plan, we just had to do it, you know, and it fit kind of my personality, you know, because as you may have noticed from the other thing, I kind of, I think the right thing to do is to do something, I just kind of did yeah. it. And, you know, and I probably pissed off a few people, you know, because, you know, Apple, you know, this was a different way of doing stuff, you know, and I've probably is pretty young and immature you know, and I knew what I wanted to do. And, you know, and you had to convince people because I didn't have a budget. It was me and a summer intern. And he was leaving in August, <laughs> right? <laughs> and we're now, we're now in June. He joined in late May, early June, I forget exactly. You know, this is all happening. I mean, he, it happened just as he's, you know, so we're there going, oh, I got a new thing. Whatever you thought you were gonna do, you're not doing that, you're doing this with me, you know? and. And so we just put together, went out and talked to a bunch of people, as we discussed yesterday. Yes. You know, talked to people in products to understand it, talked to uh, software developers that were doing anything interesting in graphics, you know, that took advantage of the laser writer. Uh, talked to analysts, both, you know, people that are following the Mac, but then through that met and talked to Jonathan uh, Seabold. Right. You know, obviously talked to the Adobe guys, and they were just, a fountain of, of, of information, you know, and it was all, they were pretty panicked about the whole thing too, right? Everybody, you know, was pretty like crisis. And so the great thing about crisis is people, you know, there's urgency, mm -hmm. you know, so, and you talk to the sales guys, they're like panicked, you know, this thing's going nowhere. They're kind of, we're not going to meet our quotas. We're not going to do, and so you have urgency, which means if you can be pretty clean and, and straightforward with what you're doing, people are craving a winner. Right. And it was that energy that was there that we were able to take advantage of, that I was able to get enough people, get someone from the training department to, to say, okay, yes, that's the right thing, we'll, we'll give resources. I'll steal some resources from PR so we had someone to help with that because they, what else were they doing, right? And, and so you, you got enough people and my boss and his boss were, even though they thought I was going too fast, you know, and they weren't sure, um, they didn't hold me back. That's the most important thing, hmm. you know. As I mentioned yesterday, you know, despite, you know, Jean-Louis Gasset thought what I was doing was stupid. You know, he, he just thought that was not the Apple way to do things. You know, he thought we really should just stay as wheels for the mind and that was the right thing to do because that was what the Macintosh was. Because that's how he had pitched it and sold it successfully in France. Mm -hmm. And it got, you know, and, and he had been successful, you know, making the Macintosh pretty successful in, 
uh, in France was by going for that kind of intellectual approach, which really connected with the French um, in, a, in a really interesting way. And so Apple, you know, Mac was doing better in France than anywhere, anywhere else. And so he thought that was the right thing to do here in the U.S. as well. I must admit, I didn't understand why that would be in conflict with you know, working it, with graphics. It, it's not in conflict. Yeah. But I was taking... Just in his mind. Uh, yes. Well, he was, he thought we were becoming a vertical solution. Mm -hmm. And he thought the notion of, of putting marketing around a vertical solution was not what... We were supposed to be going after knowledge workers, not graphic artists and publishers, right? He, he saw that as more workers, you know, doing mm. a, a specialized task as mm. opposed to communicators that are actually one of the things you do as a knowledge worker is you actually communicate. And so he didn't quite see that. And, you know, in my view was it was one of the early adopter groups that would understand it economically and, what, and they could justify buying a $12,000 system, which was two Macs and a laser writer and some software. Because knowledge workers weren't quite ready for that yet. Mm -hmm. It was just too expensive for them to do that. And so, you know, the Lisa, if the Lisa would have gone after that knowledge worker with a really expensive system too, and it wasn't quite ready for it yet either. And so uh, I, I just thought this was the only, this is what we ought to do. And I knew that it was gonna be successful in my just, all I had to see was a few of our creative services people. Uh, as I mentioned, I brought the and did a brought the system and did a demo to the Stanford Publishing course, which they do every summer. And so we did it. We did the demo in front of I don't know. They had like 30, 40 people, and they were all like, you know, everybody was just wow, you can do that. This is incredible. You know, they came from a variety of, of backgrounds. And, and once I did that, it was like I knew this was going to be a huge success. Hmm. And so from then on, I was like really, really emotionally empowered to know that this was the right thing to do. Right. Um, Just one quick question. Do you think that some of the objection might have been like almost like a, a white collar blue collar or non white collar thing? I, I don't know. It yeah. was just different. Okay. It, it was just different and it was not his his view. Okay. That was I think as I got to know him a little better. Not that I know him real well, but you know, he kinda had a, a world view and you either fit into the world view or else you're maybe not the smartest guy. Yeah. One thing I will take thirty seconds though sure. more. Sure. It, just to so this is hap you. This is in 1980. This is 85. This five. is summer of 85. Okay, so the summer of love. This is before. <laughs> you know, we the, the before picture is crisis. You leave the company. In oh, I didn't leave the company technically until early early 89. 89. Actually, yeah. So we have 85. Before is crisis. 89. Desktop publishing is a billion dollar 88 yeah coming out of 88 it was doing great you it know was, we were rocking and rolling so i think this will be fascinating to talk about how it can turn so rapidly you know um right just, place right place right time yeah boom <laughs>